and the cure are both found in returning to ground zero. So I found it appropriate as the Lord was turning within my heart over the past several months, knowing that I would be presenting on September 11th, the 21st anniversary since that fatal and fateful day. Many of you know exactly where you were. You know exactly what you felt, the impact that one day had on you and the circles that are connected to you. Some more deeply impacted than others. And as I began to formulate an outline, what came together was really inspired by the Spirit of God. But I want to give you a preface that's going to drive the entire message. And the preface is this. I do not intend to crack any codes from ancient times. I do intend, however, to crack this book right here to help us decode our times, the days we're living in. My goal is not to take any symbology too far. That would be irresponsible. However, I do know biblical symbology, biblical meaning. There are things in the Bible that are symbols. And if they have meaning behind them, there means to be a message for us today. Meaning equals message. What's the message? The third thing that I do not want to do, and hear my heart on this, I do not want to sensationalize any event in history. I know there's very real pain, grief, trauma that is attached to this national tragedy. I'm aware of that. However, my responsibility as a minister of the gospel is to look out in our world through a biblical lens with a biblical worldview and recognize the signs of the times. So I'm not going to sensationalize, but I do want to address that there has been a desensitizing of our times. We've been desensitized to what I'll call prophetic signs. Don't get turned off by that word prophetic. It means looking at the book, the truth of God's word, and making estimations and appraisals and judgments based on what we're looking at and what we're living through. So I want to connect some dots. I want to draw some lines. I want to lay some groundwork. Now, when I use the word ground zero, it's a phrase that has been pinned to 9-11, right? But that wasn't the only time that word was ever used. Ground zero has a meaning. It has a definition. It means a baseline. It means a turning point. It means to go back to the beginning of sorts. So when I say returning to ground zero, what I'm referencing is really simple. I'm referencing your ground zero, your spiritual birthplace, when God got a hold of your life. When I say spiritual ground zero, I'm also also referencing our national birthplace, when God broke ground on a nation. As Christians, as we're called, we make up what is called the Church of Jesus Christ. The Church of Jesus Christ according to Paul's letter to Timothy, was to be a pillar and ground of truth, a pillar which upholds a structure, ground being foundational, the ground or baseline of truth, ground zero of truth, and everything builds off of that ground. The church and the Christian are supposed to be, biblically, the conscience of a nation. We are the ones with the standard of a community. We live out that standard beyond a building. We are the ones, a people manifested at a certain period in time who are supposed to be about the righteousness of our God, which gives meaning to verses like this. Proverbs 14, 34, you know this verse. Drink it in. Righteousness exalts a nation. What exalts a nation? Righteousness. This would be the standard of God, the character of God. The opposite holds true, but sin or unrighteousness is a shame, reproach to any people anywhere. And both those truths, righteousness and unrighteousness, from the ground up, they begin to be pillars that society is built upon. So if righteousness exalts a people, then unrighteousness erodes a people. And whether you want to hear this or not, truth is currently under attack, and we are seeing an erosion 
of truth. Righteousness is being in right standing with God. That first form of righteousness that God gives us is positional righteousness. It's not based on anything you could do. You are righteous based on Jesus. That's positional. But the more you spend time connected to Christ, you take on a conditional righteousness, a pattern of righteousness, a lifestyle that lives right. Which means this, being in right standing with God vertically leads to standing right for God horizontally. You cannot disconnect the two. Don't let anyone convince you otherwise. Being in right standing with the God of righteousness will automatically equate into standing right as God defines it, standing for righteousness for God. That has an impact on a family, on a community, on a country. Righteousness, like salt. When Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, he was denoting something with impact and influence. Salt was added to meats and fishes. You know this, as a preservative. Take that word, preservative, to preserve, to delay decay. I don't think I could say this enough. Salt delays decay. So you, as the salt of the earth, delay the decay of the day. And you delay the decay of the day by simply being in the way, being involved, standing for righteousness, getting out and involved as the light of the world, as a city on a hill. That's what salt does. That is supposed to be the ingredient of the church. Some would push back and say, hold up a second. Are you trying to make earth heaven? No, trying to bring heaven to earth, as I'm called to do. As long as God has us here with breath in our lungs, we are called to delay the decay of the day. Now, I've often give a a phrase to the Holy Spirit just because in my mind, this is how it works itself out. The Holy Spirit is a harness, a harness that was given from heaven. So if you have the Holy Spirit within you, that is the harness of heaven living within you, the harness. It's a restrainer of sorts. In fact, I'm not taking that too far. Paul would identify the Holy Spirit as the great restrainer. The one who restrains and holds back evil and corruption. My question has always been, where is the Holy Spirit on planet Earth right now? In the believer, in the church. So we restrain. Well, the opposite is true. Without the harness of heaven in you, in the church, it's a natural progression for souls and society to be hardened by hell. Right? Without the harness of heaven delaying decay, Souls and society become hardened by hell. Let's walk and talk through this really quickly. Removing God from government produces godless government. Removing God from education produces godless education. Are you seeing this? Removing God from family produces godless families. And godless families produce godless society. And while we've been removing God, the devil has been moving in. We left a vacuum at ground zero for the enemy to move in. And God says, you don't want me in the White House? Fine. You don't want me in the schoolhouse? Fine. You don't want me in your house? Fine but you are not moving me out of my house, God says. And the church is the house of God, which helps us understand 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, moving quick, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Where? The house of God. Right here in the Lord's house. Among the people of God, judgment, refinement, a purging, a purification begins in the house of God, with the people of God. Why? Because God wants us to remove all of the impurities and get back to the purity of salt. Salt loses its flavor when it's mingled or mixed with other ingredients. Jesus said, when you lose your saltiness, how can, be, how can it be reflavored again? Well, it can't. It's good for nothing but to be thrown out on the ground and trampled underfoot. Now, if it starts with the house of God first, 
it says this, if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Like if God is willing to deal with us with warnings and purgings, what's the end for the non-believing world? I mean, we got to heed the warnings first in the house of God in order to be serious. Guys, look at me for a second with a sense of urgency to a dying world. If you're the one with the answer, the antidote, which is the risen Lord, and we believe that, should we not have a sense of urgency like a firefighter racing to a building on fire? Should that not be the sense of urgency we live by as Christians individually and as the church of Jesus Christ collectively? Now, if you're paying attention, you will notice before God acts in wrath, he always speaks in warning. He warns. Such are these days, according to Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 8, he talks about the moment that he speaks according to a nation or a people or a kingdom. The moment he speaks to bless them with good or the moment he speaks to curse them with judgment, there's this window of opportunity to respond. And it goes like this. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, returns, I will relent of the disaster, this is God, of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. If they repent, God says, I will relent. The calling of repentance always in this book right here precedes, comes before judgment. Now in Jeremiah on Thursday nights, we're looking at the cycle of judgment and I don't want you to miss this. There's a cycle of judgment all the way through the Bible. And the cycle of judgment, as God brings judgment, it accomplishes two things simultaneously. The first, judgment touches the remnant. And the remnant are experiencing refinement. The remnant are those that return. You're in the midst of the world, yet you're experiencing the same judgment on the world. You return to the Lord. He refines. He purifies. He draws you closer to himself. Then there's the deviant, the defiant, the disobedient. They experience God's judgment as punishment. It's happening simultaneously. And what you're seeing over the past two years is a divide. And you're getting to see where people's loyalties lie. God is judging because he's refining and he's punishing. Symbology in the Bible. One of the great groundbreakings for ancient Israel was the dedication of their temple. Bible scholars all agree the temple was the epicenter of religion in fact, it was the epicenter of their political and religious identity. The construction of the temple where God would dwell with his people, where the sacrificial system will find its place, where not only Jerusalem and Israel, but the surrounding world, the Gentiles, would be able to come and find God in a central location. And his people were supposed to be that beacon, like a lighthouse, like a landmark, where they would be able to see God. So I go back in the book in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, where we see a, gr a groundbreaking, the ground zero of the temple. Chapter 6 is often not quoted with 2 Chronicles chapter 7, but you got to get through chapter 6 before you land in chapter 7. We all know 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, but the context that bleeds into verse 14, right? If my people were called by my name, what precedes it? Well, let's look at it. Chapter 6 is Solomon dedicating the temple on behalf of the people. And he says this prayer. And I don't want to get lost in the details of the prayer, but he basically says this. If we begin to sin and drift away from you, and you allow natural disasters to touch us, pestilence, locusts, famine, and even foreign enemies, if you allow any of those factors to touch us and we return to you, would you return to us? That's 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Read it on your own time. It's Solomon's long prayer. And then, almost a month later, God visits Solomon by way of the answer of that prayer. So with that in mind, if we sin against you and you allow all these factors to touch us and we return to you, would you heal us? Would you spare us? Would you give us another window of grace? Q, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. What prayer? Chapter 6. I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. 
Verse 13, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, here it is. Here's that verse we often misquote. If my people at that point who are called by my name will humble themselves, surrender, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. See, returning to the Lord is connected to turning from wickedness and unrighteousness. God will respond. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive sin. That's a promise and heal land. Now I'm aware I study the Bible. Contextually, this is applied to the nation of Israel. But I also know another people who are called by his name. So though this is a promise for Israel, I don't intend to take the promise and apply it to the church in America. But there are parallels, scripturally speaking. And if you don't see the parallel, we're always called to return to the Lord, no matter how far we have strayed. And if I'm looking at natural disasters or signs and symptoms of corruption or tragedy, and it touches the land and the church and the Christian are supposed to be the first and foremost to rise to the occasion and be the conscience of any given nation, then the parallel will be true. If people begin to return to the Lord, would God spare the judgment that is looming over America? That's the point. So we pause, we pivot, and we go from the dedication of a temple to the actual dedication of a people. When did that happen? April 30th, 1789. Not July 4th, 1776. July 4th, 1776 was the conception of a nation, a political conception. They had to go through birth pains and contractions known as the Revolutionary War before they could have a birth, a spiritual birth of a nation which took place on April 30th, 1789, mark it. It's the first inaugural address given by the first president of these United States of America, namely George Washington, where Federal Hall in New York City, which was America's first capital, not Philadelphia. Yep. Where's that at? Ground zero. Federal Hall on ground zero, on the balcony where George Washington said this in light of our first government, the foundation of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. In other words, he understood it was God who governed people, not government. Government was in place to protect the people. Then he said these most famous words, we ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven, the favorable smiles of heaven, heaven's favor can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and the right which heaven itself has ordained. He said that on April 30th, 1789, ground zero of the United States of America, at ground zero. Translation, God will lift his favor if we ever disregard his law and his order. You know what they did next? After being sworn in with his hand on the Bible, the entire government, the Senate, the House, they made their way from Federal Hall and proceeded to St. Paul's Chapel. St. Paul's Chapel is the only standing structure left at ground zero in its original form. And it wasn't spontaneous. In fact, it was a planned event. And the entire government went into St. Paul's Chapel where they dedicated this land to the Lord. In fact, the entire nation was told at a certain time on April 30th, 1789, when bells would ring all across the land by way of church steeples, that everyone was to commit to prayer, the land and its leaders. In other words, the first official act of our government was to dedicate the land to God. To this day, on a plaque above Washington's pew at St. Paul's Chapel, located at ground zero, a plaque that says, Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that you will keep 
the United States in holy protection. April 30th, 1789. Ladies and gentlemen, before it was called Ground Zero as we know it, that location was a groundbreaking. Don't miss what the Bible says. God alone establishes nations. That's what it means to have a biblical worldview. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, God changes the times. God changes the seasons. God raises up kings. God removes kings. Acts 17, 26, he's the one that makes all people from one blood, every nation of man. And God is the, listen, listen to this. Acts 17, 26, God determines their pre-appointed times when a nation would come to be and their boundaries, borders. Job 12, 23, God makes nations great or destroys them. Oh, by the way, we will never make America great again unless we make America godly again. And we won't be able to make America godly again until we make church biblical again. Job 12, 23 continues that it's God who expands nations and governs them. And he uses ordinary men and women, of course, for his purposes. God will use unrighteous leaders to accomplish his righteous rule. Ground zero. We call it ground zero based on the devastation and the destruction on September 11, 2001, 21 years ago. Ground zero, as we know it, became this landmark moment in our country's history. 212 years later, from April 30th, 1789, and that ground zero to this ground zero. You know, when I was writing some of these threads and thinking through the topics, there was one component I was missing, and it was actually the raw emotion behind that day. How could I possibly, I was a junior in high school when it occurred, I remember what class I was in, I remember the teacher, I remember the news came on, I remember that week unfolding, but I don't know if I can get into the emotion that is directly or personally impacted by it. And then I receive an email from an individual who comes here infrequently, but we stay in touch online. And he literally writes to me and he basically says, here's my testimony, I don't share it with too many people. It took me 10 years to even write it, but I'm sharing it with you. He has no clue that I'm preaching on 9-11. And he begins to tell me from his vantage point, his perspective, where he was when it all unfolded. He was in the city and the Lord was prompting him to do certain things and get out of the city. And he watched actually as the planes hit the tower and he was in a meeting when it occurred and they eventually closed down the meeting. He got onto the subway, it was chaos. People were covered in, 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 in all the dust and like people were disoriented. You could tell there was great devastation. Nobody knew what was happening. He got into the subway, he made his way back to his hometown in Virginia where then they eventually heard that there was another attack on the Pentagon and a field in Pennsylvania. And he's telling me the emotions that he had. And I remember saying, God, you're so good to give me this gift that I would never just rush through it as if it's not connected to actual people. And yet the response the week after and three months would be the window do you remember the mainstream mantras? God bless America was trending. United we stand was trending. We will never forget was trending. Social scientists have conducted polls and surveys based on those three months, interestingly, from September 2001, right at December 24th. That became the bookend. Why? It was as if right after that Christmas season, Things began to return to normal. In fact, there was a 10 to 20% increase in church attendance in the United States of America. Do you have any idea how significant a 10 to 20% increase in the churches in America for those few months after 9-11? You know what happened in January of 2002? It went back to the status quo. Three months where people were responding, seemingly outwardly turning to God, praying God's blessing upon a land 
And I wonder from heaven's perspective, what was God up to? What was he after? What is he always after? I'll tell you, to God, it's not about church attendance. To God, it's not about national allegiance. To God, it's always about repentance, returning to him and his way. And it's interesting, they came to challenge Jesus about some tragedies that happened locally. In Luke chapter 13, verses one through five, there were tragedies. There was hardship and tragedy from the hands of the government. And then there was seeming natural disaster. It was the Tower of Shalom, as we know. 18 lives lost their life. They come to Jesus and they're asking, like, were these people being judged by God? And Jesus answers. He says, listen, no, they weren't any worse sinner than anybody else that lives. But unless you repent, he said, so will you perish. I don't know, what was Jesus doing? He's saying, stop trying to dissect everything that's happening and understand the heart of God is repentance. A radical return to our Lord. So instead of seeing national repentance from ground zero and up, what we saw was national defiance. How so? The very next day, September 12, 2001, Then Senate Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, he spoke to the combined Senate and House of Representatives 24 hours later to the people of the United States and the watching world in a joint resolution expressing the sense of the Senate and the House of Representatives regarding the terroristic attacks launched against the United States on September 11th, 2001. And this is what he said. The world should know that the members of both parties and both houses stand united. The full resources of our government will be brought to bear in aiding the search and rescue and in hunting down those responsible and those who may have aided or harbored them. Nothing, nothing can replace the losses that have been suffered, he said. I know, I know there is only the smallest measure of inspiration that can be taken from this devastation. He continued, and he said this. But there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. That is what we will do. We will rebuild and we will recover. The people of America will stand strong together because the people of America have always stood together. And those of us privileged to serve this great nation will stand with you. God bless the people of America. He quoted Isaiah 9, 10, which reads this, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones, stronger material, stronger stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace with cedar, a more durable wood. He said, this is what we will do. We will rebuild, we will recover. God bless the people of America. It was admirable. It sounded honorable. It certainly provided comfort to those that were grief-stricken, who less than 24 hours, under 3,000 lives, casualties of an attack, a strike on our soil. But if truth be told and reality seen, God bless America. God cannot bless the people of America if the people of America do not live to bless God, okay? Now, why is this verse significant? Well, they cherry-picked it, number one. They Google searched any verses or references that would deal with structures falling down. That is likely what yielded Isaiah 9.10. And sadly, you can't take a verse out of context. You can't take a verse and apply it without understanding why it's even said in the first place. So we do our due diligence as Bible believers, and we look at the context by which Isaiah 9:10 was even said in the first place, and then we look at it applied 
to our present day. And here's the context, Isaiah 9, verses 8 to 10. This is the Lord through the prophet Isaiah at a time where they were in a vulnerable um, inflection point, where he was warning them and he was calling them to return. In fact, he would use a foreign enemy, the Assyrians, who had a very similar dialect and Arabic language as the terrorists in our day. And this is what God said to them. The Lord sent a word against Jacob and it has fallen on Israel to his people. All the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that surrounding area, who, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace with cedars. In other words, it was not a statement of national excitement returning to the Lord. It was a statement saying, regardless of how God strikes us, we're going to build back better. That is absolutely not heeding the warning in verses 8 and 9. In fact, that's defiance. One Bible commentator said this, thus they breathe the very spirit of defiance. The Israelites said, we're not going to return to you regardless of the strike, regardless of the bricks falling, regardless of us replacing the sycamores with cedars. We're going to do it in our own strength. Other public officials, September 12th, same day, 2001, Senator John Kerry stated in a speech to the Senate, I believe one of the first things we should commit to with federal help that underscores our nation's purpose is to rebuild the towers of the World Trade Center and show the world we are not afraid, we are defiant. July 4th, 2004, of course, that monumental day, three years later, Governor of New York, George Pataki, said at a ceremony at the floor of Ground Zero, today, we, the heirs of this revolutionary spirit of defiance, we lay this cornerstone. And that became the cornerstone that would eventually lead to the building of the eventual replacement to those World Trade Center towers, one World Trade Center. Three years later, on the anniversary of September 11th, then Democratic candidate for Vice President Jonathan Edwards spoke the same curse upon America using the same verse from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 10. He said, good morning. Today, on this day of remembrance and mourning, we have the Lord's word to get us through. The bricks have fallen but we will build with dressed stone. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. And then he proceeded to say this, let me show you how we are building and putting cedars in those three hallowed places, the footprints of the towers, the Pentagon, and the field in Pennsylvania. Did you know at Ground Zero, St. Paul's Chapel, the only standing structure, because it was shielded from steel beams that fell from one of the towers, it was shielded by a sycamore tree. And right there next to the chapel, the sycamore tree was uprooted. But they would look at this tree and they were astonished that this tree spared this amazing landmark in America's history. So what did they do? They memorialized the sycamore tree. An artist named Steve Tobin came in and with resources provided by the government, they memorialized the sycamore of ground Zero. It became known as the survivor's tree. It was a point of inspiration, absolutely. But out of all the medals and all the ways to memorialize a tree, he decided to cover it in bronze. Now, why is that significant? Well, bronze biblically is always the medal of judgment. But not only that, they decided to replace the sycamore with cedar. As if they were looking at the actual verse and saying, let's do exactly what ancient Israel did, not having any clue that they were defying the one true God. There's a tree called the tree of hope that is a cedar that is planted in the same ground where the sycamore is. And again, I said earlier, this is symbology. I do not intend to take any symbology too far. However, symbols have meaning. That's not all we did. As we know, we rebuilt the tower. Did you know there was an argument and a debate behind closed doors about what it should be called? It was originally called the Freedom Tower. They eventually were able to call it One World Trade Center. One World Trade. Did you know that on April 30th, 2012, April 30th, to the day, 223 years later to the day at Ground Zero, 
they would complete it where it would become the tallest building in New York City. Oh, they rebuilt it stronger. What of other symbols? Well, two of our national symbols included the Pentagon, which became a world power based on our military might after World War II. And the Twin Towers also became a world power as an economic financial symbol around the world after World War II. Now, dates to me mean something. I don't want to take these too far, but I found the discovery interesting that Henry Hudson himself discovered the grounds of Manhattan Island on September 11th, 1609, where he continued up that same river that now bears his name. Eventual Dutch settlers would come into that area known as Manhattan Island, where they would settle at what we call Ground Zero, where a group of merchants, after the foundation of our country from April 30th, 1789, three years later, a group of merchants, 24 to be exact, would gather on a certain street where they built a wall. And they built a wall there because they were protecting their economy from pirates and Indians. And when the British came, they tore down that wall. But the name of the street retained the name, Wall Street. They then signed an agreement, which became the New York Stock Exchange. The New York Stock Exchange has an actual formal name. It's called the Buttonwood Agreement. Why? Because they signed their agreement under a buttonwood tree. The buttonwood tree is a sycamore tree. In other words, the sycamore has always been a symbol of our nation's financial strength. And then the date of the groundbreaking ceremony for the construction of the Pentagon, September 11th, 1941. Now, I'm just simply saying there's some significance here. I don't know if the enemies or whoever they were that knew these dates, they planned it. It makes no difference to me. I look at the Bible and I realize God is constantly trying to warn us. And these are national symbols. And when national symbols are struck, a people should respond. And that was 2001. And two cycles of seven later in 2015, another national symbol was struck. And by the way, not all strikes are from foreign enemies, physical or seen. Some are spiritual, because in June of 2015, our White House was struck by a symbol, a rainbow. And the rainbow is the symbol of God's promise, and one of our most important landmarks decided to light up in the color of a rainbow. Seven years later, in September of 2022, another national symbol, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, where another speech occurred that was the most political divisive speech ever given on our soil, the most spiritually deceptive speech. God is warning us. He is striking these symbols to get his people to see how far we have fallen. What is God interested in? Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, for any people in any time. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. We should not glory in our impressive foundation and our governmental wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. We have put so much stock into our military might. But if we don't recognize it's blessed by God, we have put so much stock into our financial prowess and prominence around the world. Yet if we've not recognized, it has all been blessed by the hands of God. So what are we to glory in? Let him who glories glory in this. You want to glory? You want to make America godly again? Glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. See, since 9-11, there's been a defiant spirit of build back better that is actually antithetical to building back biblical. In fact, the spirit behind build back better is the same spirit that is bringing back Babel. And there you have the cycles again the enemy bringing back a system that is anti-Christ, anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-truth. And again, if the 
president of the United States makes mention that we are in a war or a battle for the soul of America, that is not a political statement, ladies and gentlemen, part of the Church of Jesus Christ. That is a spiritual statement through and through. We are in the battle for the soul of a people in that same speech on September 1st at Independence Hall, President Biden said, I believe America is at an inflection point, one of the moments that determines the shape of everything that's to come after. I don't know how much further we can go where God is giving us a window of opportunity to return. And without the church of Jesus Christ standing in the way, you better believe the spirit of Antichrist is going to have its way. And that is why we need to return to our ground zero, our individual birthplace in the Lord. We need to return to our national ground zero, our national birthplace in the Lord by divine providence. We need to return to the ground zero of truth, back to the basics, the ground zero of biology, male and female, the ground zero of sexuality, divinely designed for marriage between a man and a woman, the ground zero of morality according to the Ten Commandments, the ground zero of the family, the nuclear structure of a father and a mother and children and offspring, the ground zero of society, the ground zero of government as God designed it. Jeremiah 6, thus says the Lord, this is the word of the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Same spirit of defiance. Also, I set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. God gives watchmen to warn, listen, pay attention, wake up. And the people said, I'm offended. We will not listen. Church, if we do not return to our biblical foundation, we will not return from this anti-biblical conversion. If we don't return now, we will not be able to return later. I'm not just saying that as a people group. I'm saying that individually to you this morning. If you don't return to your biblical foundation as an individual child of God, as a Christian, God is calling each of us to take responsibility and actually return to him and begin to live our lives built on a biblical, sturdy foundation, as opposed to being conformed to an antichrist culture, conformed to the world around us. This God we serve is not willing for any to perish, the Bible says. It says he's not willing for any to perish, but that all would return and repent. That all would come to repentance. So we need to take these prophetic warnings given to us as a blessing to wake up, to open our eyes, to have ears to hear. It's a call to repent. It's a call to return. It's a call to come to Christ where we find rest for our souls. So with heads bowed, if you will, and eyes closed, if there's anyone here who has never given their life to Christ, you don't have the opportunity to build on a biblical foundation until you first come to the chief architect. If you've never given your life to Christ, and you feel him knocking on the heart and mind. And he's saying to you, I'm waiting for you to open up. As you know, today for you could be a glorious ground zero. Like you're going to start at the baseline. You're going to start from scratch. All of your wrong, all of your sin, everything you've done, past, things you're struggling with in the present, sin and hardships not yet experienced, Christ has paid for. It's what the cross symbolizes, another symbol, symbol with meaning. Jesus Christ went to that cross for your soul. He wanted to tear down the building of your life so that he can rebuild your life upon his life. If you've never given your life to Christ, please hear me. 
ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior right now in your heart. It's very simple, nothing magical. It's an intimate conversation in your heart with God. Say, Lord, hear my heart. You don't even have to use my words. These are your words. Lord, I give you my life. I receive fresh forgiveness of sins. Lord, mark this day as my ground zero, my return to you. Save my soul for eternity. Begin to build on my life. Take a moment to say that prayer. Soak that in. Now I'm going to ask if anybody said that prayer, would you just throw up your hand? Thank you, I see you. If anybody said that prayer for the first time and you actually intimately meant it, would you, would you throw your hand up? I just want to see you. Nobody else is looking. I saw the one that did. Anybody else? God sees you. He saw that prayer, hears you, loves you. You've just become a daughter or a son of the Most High God. I want to encourage you right after this service, there will be prayer leaders up front. Make your way up front. As soon as we're done, come on up. Tell somebody that decision you made. We want to provide you with materials to begin your walk, to build from ground zero. This is the day the Lord has made. So we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. Father, bless these people, this message, as far and wide as you would have it go, that it would draw people back to our biblical foundation and that we would serve you to the end of days. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.